Yeah. I will get you back. Oh, that's terrible, terrible. How many Mendel was, was busy tonight? You know, I, I really did grow up in Appalachia, and um, I, I owe my poetry to my dad, who um, was a millwright, and every morning before he went to work, he used to write a poem. So somehow I inherited this bad habit, as my wife Mary will testify. Every morning, first thing, I write a poem. Some of them are terrible. A lot of them are really bad. A lot of them are so terrible, and I still put them up on my blog. In any case, um, I've got uh, a, a mixture of things that I'd like to read. Uh, there's really three theme themes that run through my poetry. Um, part of the spiritual journey, so there's sort of an inspirational side to what I write about because um, that's something that's always been important to me. Um, the other thing is nature, and um, you know I'm blessed to have uh, the North Chagoon Res Reservation is our backyard, my wife's gardens. So, you know, we got all this great stuff to work from. You planted the entire chagrin. <laughs> she did, she did, and she maintains it. Um, and, and the third uh, thing is just everyday life, because I think we overlook uh, so much. So poetry kind of forces me to just pay attention. So it's kind of a great... Uh, way it's an it's it's an it's an honor system for me just to kind of wake up. Um, I'd like to start with uh, a couple of poems about uh, uh, poetry and uh, poets in particular because uh, it 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 strikes me that sometimes when I don't know what else to write about I write poems about poetry. Uh, this one is entitled uh, "The Word Charmer." Cobra-like words dancing on empty online pages following the Creator's hand side to side and up to down, merging briefly with the hand that feeds them, tempted at times to bite it, then quickly dancing away, at times mouthing the words with slippery pointed tongue and thick red lips so large even the dictionary could hide behind them. Releasing them finally like soft bubbles, drifting in thin air, Charming hard women into ladies, and callous men into well-mannered young boys. Words snaking their way inside you, making you squirm and shudder as they fill your heart. As they bring back the dead part of you, buried long ago but never forgotten. Beware the word charmer, he becomes you, and you become him. It's the imagery there, uh, and poems just have a way of sometimes snaking up inside me. This one is entitled, uh, Just a Poem in Between. What do you do when someone gets inside you, someone you never knew you knew, and suddenly they are deep part of you? What do you do when something you've dreamed of when you've been both asleep and awake magically appears from the other side of the mirror? What do you do when your fading reality creates choices you don't want to make, setting you adrift in the tide, washing you hopelessly out to sea? What do you do when a kindred spirit overtakes you like a serene tsunami and you're left drowning in your own feelings you never knew you had? What do you do when something beneath your conscious mind spills, into, spills you into another galaxy and you are speechless to describe? You write a feeble poem hoping it will save you from yourself and from what you might do if there wasn't at least a poem between you and this new reality. Woo! Any of you that uh, have been into poetry for a while will understand this one. The Poet's Pain. I wonder seriously if I'd have my poetry if I didn't have my pain. You smile smugly, thinking perhaps you know my pain. Rest assured you don't, and frankly, there's no need for you to know my pain. After all, it's mine, and you have your own pain that gives rise to your poetry and your maddening dreams and your insufferable prognostications in your fits of sexual hallucination, or even drunken spells leaving you numb. That happens once in a while, Steve, doesn't it? Yes, poets suffer, not first with their poetry, but with life. And those reading poetry suffer too, not with the poetry they read, but also with life. I think of Oscar Wilde, who once said, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Wilde's point isn't that mis misery loves company, rather, some of us are more able to use our misery to see the whole of life, including pain. For some of us, poetry is a weapon of choice, 
and seeing the reality of pain without the rose-colored glasses. I do. I do. I do. What would we do without post-its? George, what would we do? This is entitled uh, Journey to the Heart. And, um, you know, when I think about some poems that kind of strike, strike you as being pretty, I would use this word to, to describe just that. Wonderful long-held secrets abound in your heart. They patiently await you. Open the door and enter with honesty. Trust what that honesty brings. Discover and unwrap the many unopened presents that await you at your heart's door. Take them inside and open them, allowing the love they contain to grow. Rediscover the many gifts of love filling your heart throughout your lifetime. Revel in their beauty and live in their unshakable promise that once a gift of love has been given, it is always with you. Love is our essence. For some of us, it has taken longer to realize that love is what we really are. And for some of us, our entire journey in life has been about discovering the secrets that lie buried deep in the cave of our heart. It's not a long journey, really, when you're ready. The heart requires no reservations to visit what it holds. Getting there can be as simple as floating on a lotus blossom on the still waters of your soul. Pretty. Um, prisoners of thought. Steve, you'll relate to this with your Buddhist inclinations uh, and this whole struggle about how we get outside our heads. Our minds are prisons, chained to our thoughts. We're all prisoners to what we think. Each idea we hold on to, no matter how elegant, is a missed opportunity to experience reality. Imprisoned minds coll collude in their desire to control what really doesn't exist. Entire worlds are built upon impermanent ideas seeking physical and psychic form. So we create words and numbers, hoping they help us exist. All thoughts are dreams reflecting what we wish for but doesn't exist. Tonight there is no escape. I continue dreaming even in my sleep, I think. We are never free as long as we are thinking beings instead of just being. Taking useless pride in our thoughts, we think we can think our way into existence. The truly educated mind perceives without thinking. It forgets what others long to remember. The educated mind doesn't allow thoughts to stand in the way of reality. No matter how hard it tries, this poem misses reality. It is only a poetic illusion trying to take form as reality. Yeah, these things are growing. Help me. Fresh raindrops on wildflowers. This is really inspired from my childhood. One of the things that poetry has done is it's helped me to reconnect with my childhood. Sometimes it were very difficult for me, but it has just been uh, such, a, such a powerful healing experience. And uh, poetry, more than anything, I think brings out the child within. It's, it's just amazing. It's so pure. It's just like this poem, which uh, just kind of, you know, it wrote itself almost. Um, fresh raindrops on wildflowers. Glistening silver raindrops cling to pastel rose angels nestled in patches along Old County Road. I'm happy the road is still unpaved. Its originality gives me hope that my childhood still lives within me. Wildflowers can be so carefree, even adolescently reckless, how they comb their hair. Oh, to be a wildflower. We came here often as young boys, just curious boys in Martins Ferry, walking down dirt roads, flirting with truth and beauty, seeing the world with fresh eyes, untarnished by skepticism, receiving eyes, like those that notice fresh raindrops on wildflowers. That's kind of that way. Okay, another, another poem that has sort of a Buddhist twist. I don't have to do that dance, do I? A little chubby checker? Okay. No, no, we say that for later. Okay. <laughs> you minus what you think and do. The twist. The twist. It's a new twist on things. You minus what you think and do. 
You are not the work deadline coming up at 9 o'clock this morning. You are not the person who is 25 pounds lighter than you really are. You are not the perfect parent who never makes a mistake. You are not the person who writes perfect poetry. You are not your aging mother's pain and suffering that haunts you like a ghost. Do yourself and others a favor. Get real with yourself. Forget all the nonsense that fills your head. Accept who you are, minus everything that you think you are. This is one of a couple uh, longer poems that I'd like to read. Um, and, and this is dedicated to uh, James Wright, who happens to be from my hometown, and Steve was the bearer of sad news. What, what, you got fans, you got James Wright fans. <laughs> Um, I, I didn't know, this is the only year that we've missed the festival, that this was the last year, so it's held in uh, Martin Surrey, my hometown. It's just a great experience to reconnect. Um, and, you know, it's too bad. Annie Wright, his uh, widow, is just, Mary, is she not a, an amazing lady? She's just, she's just tremendous. Um, so, here's, here's, here he goes. Chemistry of Fairy in the 50s. Hard-working sons and daughters of immigrant warriors, brave souls accustomed to long days and even longer nights. Folks who sleep with their windows open in the summertime and pray for a breeze, even the slightest, to dry the trickling sweat down their, the sweat trickling down their aching backs. Silently worrying in their dark bedrooms about money, family, and health, and hoping there really is a God who can provide a miracle ending their pain and suffering. Even in all this suffering, there is a deeper chemistry that makes up these people, their hopes, their dreams, and their struggles. Men who cash their paychecks on Friday nights at the local A&P grocery store and who always forget something on their wives' shopping lists. Men with steel-hard hands with sandpaper rough calluses from turning wrenches, picking coal, and pounding smoothness into bowed steel sheets. Men who awkwardly hug their children, hoping that chemistry helps them find their way in life without too much pain and sorrow. Like their parents and grandparents, the people of Martins Ferry restlessly search for the dream, you know, the American dream. Like the thick, lazy streams of smoke drifting from the chimneys atop their houses, their dreams form heavy 1950s clouds, keeping them from seeing beyond today's bills and their sick child who must go to the doctor. Children shoot marbles, cat's eyes and boulders under the giant tree on the Elm School playground. The sun breaks through the clouds just for a moment, but long enough to keep the faint dream alive that they inherit early from their stern, hardworking parents who complain about their materialistic children and how they will never come to visit them on Sunday afternoons when they grow old. There is a chemistry about a place, especially the place you grew up. It lingers in your soul, quietly waiting for the right moment to come out. It shows in how you greet strangers, how you shine your shoes in the morning, how generous you are with your smile, especially when you don't feel loved. It even makes a cameo appearance in how you cut your grass. The chemistry of Martins Ferry can be as rancid as the dead catfish that fishermen leave along the shores of the mighty Ohio, and it can be as sweet and peaceful as the sun-filled clover fields that invite young boys to lie on their back and dream of far-off places they will someday visit. Either way, the chemistry makes us who we are. A couple more, and then we're going to turn it back over so Michael gets his, uh, his shot. I um, want to read a few from uh, my new book, which is entitled uh, Walks in Life's Sacred Garden, and uh, hot off of the, the press, and... Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an improvement over the first one. You know, it's a nice feeling when you can look at the first book and you say, that was, that was pretty good, and then you do a better job. By golly, you feel better about it. So, you know, there's, there's, there's something to it. Okay. Let's do a few uh, spiritual ones and then a few humorous ones. How about that? We've got to end on a light note. <laughs> this is entitled, There Are Deep Places. There are deep places like valleys you wear that you can't shake loose until you give them all that you have. There are deep places cutting your world in half, separating you from your questions and answers. There are deep places sucking you in and making you believe there is a limit to how far you can fall. 
There are deep places you must go to find yourself and lose the illusions following you through life like perpetual shadows. There are deep places that seem to surface just about the time you think you have life all figured out. Plumb these depths but carefully and never forget that these places are there because your life starts and stops and restarts again in these deep places. One more serious one. A friend of ours, uh, after a long struggle with uh, cancer, uh, died just a couple months ago. And uh, so. Um, this, uh, this isn't a humorous one, is it? This is not. Uh, this is not. This is very serious. And it's entitled, We Walk This Road But Once. Can I take this? Yes. We walk this road but once. There is no stopping us once we're here until the road we travel ends and then a piece of us continues on another road that we can't know until the road we're on has ended. We come this way but once. It's always the first time on whatever road we travel. It's always the first time on whatever road we walk. Next time we walk a road, may we be gently reminded we've walked other roads before, but on this road we shall walk but once. Okay, I lied. A Cleveland poem and then um, a couple humorous ones, okay? This is entitled Cleveland's Lake Erie. God, are we lucky. You know, we don't know it. You know, it's just like we got this magnificent lake and we drive by it or Mary and I don't see it enough because uh, we live inland next to the metro parks. Cleveland's Lake Erie. Pretty garden. Proud but smaller than her four siblings, Erie wraps herself like a rough-hewn blue-gray shawl around Cleveland's burly brown and green shoulders. She hugs the, cities in pla the city in places, giving needed comfort and reassurance. Then, like any beautiful woman, she steps back and flirts at a distance, even sometimes defying our advances. Her shallow waters seethe at times, standing tall and swaying back and forth like a quiver of king cobras. Her current 4,000-year-old incarnation remains hard to fathom, let alone her pre-Pleistocene Ice Age roots stretching back over two million years. With age comes grace, and surely this fair lady commands our respect for her deep flowing wisdom and beauty. All this said, why is such scarce notice given by us to this watery Cinderella to our north? Amen. This is the mundane. You ready? In search of a metaphysical explanation why two toilets crap out at the same time. <laughs> Crappers crap out, even the best of them. And that would be <clears throat> a toto, or as our $150 an hour plumber says, um, even, even underused toilets uh, die. Go figure. I wouldn't be kidding if I said all this beats the crap out of me. <laughs> Why would two fine, upstanding commodes bite the dust at the same time? Reincarnation plans together? It would be different if we had young hooligans about the house who thought flushing tennis balls was an entertaining way to spend a cold, snowy Sunday morning. Well, the good news is we are the proud parents of two identical twin Tudo, Toto toilets, both just waiting to show us what they can do. Can't wait to give them a test drive. <laughs> so, I'm going to stop there, and you know, if we've got some time, we can. That's great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We got open mic list. Sign up soon. Thank you, Don, and I'm sorry for fucking up your introduction. No problem. But I know why I fucked it up, because you're from Martins Ferry, and I asked you where you were from, and you said you were from Mayfield Heights. That'll do it every time. And uh, it, it's hard to, like, to understand that kind of thing until you have to meet the police squad on the Carnegie Bridge. What we call the Hope Memorial Bridge now because it's so fucking nice. <laughs>